Hey, it's me, Travis, your host. I'm doing my own pitch. <laughs> How lame is that? So anyway, yeah, if you listen to this podcast, thanks. But be forewarned, you could be unfriended, unfollowed, and uncompromising if you listen to Rethinking Revelation. What are you kidding? We got us an awesome podcast here. Welcome back to another exciting adventure of Rethinking Revelation. I'm your host, Travis Finley. This is episode 72. We have Ed Stevens with us today. Ed Stevens is the president of IPA, which I love. I love IPA. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, not India Pale Ale, but International Preterist Association. I was wondering why he was so confused when I was asking him about his his brewing process and where he got his hops and his barley from. Now, that makes perfect sense. I'm just kidding. I never did that. All right. Uh, Ed Stevens is the president of IPA, International Preterist Association. Preterist.org is his website. His mission is to glorify Jesus Christ and serve the Christian community as the leading publisher and distributor of conservative Christian preterist information. He produces a weekly teaching podcast called Then and Now. He publishes and sells preterist books, multimedia resources, sponsors seminars on preterist eschatology around the world, sets up book tables, answers emails of those interested in the preterist perspective, and he provides a source of information to contact other preterists in your area. Ed, welcome to Rethinking Revelation. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all, not at all. Why don't you tell us a little bit just about what keeps you busy and what makes you happy, and uh, you know, and then we'll get going. Well, I think uh, what keeps me uh, going in my research is a historical perspective. Uh, way back when I was a young Christian in college, uh, one of the things I discovered was Josephus in the Baptist Church. They had never mentioned the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, or they had never even mentioned Josephus. I didn't have a clue who he was, but one of the guys in the dormitory down the hall from me had Josephus in his library. And I knew he was a theologian. And he was preparing to go to Dallas Theological Seminary when he got through with college. And so I knew that was some kind of a theological book, and I asked him, what in the world is Josephus? And he says, that was a first century Jewish priest who recorded the history of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that just blew me away. And from that point on, I was really just enthused about history. And it's never gotten any better. I mean, I've totally absorbed myself into history. And one of the questions that I wanted to answer whenever I became a preterist is, okay, uh, all these expectations that the first century saints had about the fulfillment of these things, how were those, how were their expectations historically fulfilled? You know? And that's part of the reason why I wrote this book on the final decade before the end, was to answer that very question. How were their expectations actually fulfilled in history? Excellent. So here at Rethinking Revelation, my podcast is basically a, um, a free-for-all and a catch-all for hermeneutics, broadly speaking. That's what this podcast is about, hermeneutics. And Rethinking Revelation is a bit of a double entendre. It's, it's got reference to, obviously, the last book of the Bible, but then it also treats all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, as Revelation. So we are Rethinking Revelation. And so um, in my experience growing up as a Christian, I have 
realized more and more that it's not just enough to simply read the Bible at face value. We have to be aware of other uh, issues that are at play in the text. And I think so the one thing that we'll do today is talk about how uh, extra biblical historical um, information is a part of that dance. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of want to just turn you loose and just see what you say. And if I have a question or if I want to stop and and uh, ask anything, I'll, I'll do that. But let me say this for a moment, I suppose. Let's say this. One of the criticisms that I've heard of a preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation is, why doesn't the Bible have a, a record of the destruction of Jerusalem? And well, because it was written, you know, before it happened. I mean, it right. to record history before right. it happens. Yeah, but uh, in, in, their, in their defense, they'll say, and since it doesn't have a record of it having happened, that ipso facto gives large credence to the fact that it's still future. So there's one popular guy on, on Facebook. Uh, I won't mention his name just for, just for kindness sake. But that's his one of his biggest issues is the Bible does not record. So for them, as a fundamentalist, if the Bible doesn't record it, you know, it's almost like it didn't happen. So that's why we still have to have a future, um, a future expectation of what the New Testament expected. So you're right. You're right, Ed. I'll, I'll tell you, you're right. The New Testament yeah, prophesied. Yeah, and, and that's a very interesting uh, observation and criticism of the Preterist view. And, and I accept that on its own terms. And here's how I would turn that on its head. Of course, there's going to be a record. What if that happened in 70 AD? What would be the effect of that on any Christians after that recording the fulfillments of those events? In other words, if they were still around, then it would be certainly expected that there would be some historical record of those fulfillments. And so the futurist objection is, is certainly valid. But if there was a rapture, that expectation for a written record of fulfillments may not be valid because those people were not around to record the fulfillment. So I would say that that futurist argument against the preterist view is easily countered by the rapture view. So why don't you why don't you take a little bit of time to differentiate between your understanding of that and the the popular dispensational understanding of the rapture. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you for letting me do that. Uh, there's several differences between our concept and the traditional dispensational pre-trib position. First of all, the pre-trib, uh, they believe that there's a seven-year uh, delay of the real second coming that Christ comes first to rapture his saints before the tribulation, and then he comes at the end of the tribulation to, uh, you know, uh, pour out his wrath, etc. But that's not the concept that we have. We have uh, what we would call a mid-trib or post-trib rapture position. Okay, so let me, let me stop you real quick so that we can maybe just do a little bit of a station identification in terms of theological nuances. So the dispensational view of the eschaton is that it didn't come the way the prophets said it would. So there's a parenthesis. And when it gets started back up again, there's a future seven-year tribulation which culminates the 70 weeks of Daniel. So the 70 weeks of Daniel should have ended. Right. And yeah, they've got that gap in there. They right. Use all Sure. Devices to get around the plain sense of Matthew 24 okay. and Daniel 9 and right. Daniel 12. And uh, as you know, in the book of Revelation, it also sequences that stuff pretty clearly. But uh, the, the net effect is that we're different from them because we take Matthew 24's uh, verse 29 to 31 as the actual sequencing of that. So that there's not a secret rapture like Margaret McDonald. 
forgotten back 150 years ago for pound at the insistence of Irving and Schofield and all those guys. Uh, so our view of the rapture is you know, significantly different and biblical. Uh, their view is that, that secret rapture, which they invented out of the thin air. All right. Uh, so that's one big difference. And the other difference is the, the way it actually is supposed to occur. They have uh, airplanes falling out of the air, you know, and people's bodies rising up in the sky, leaving their clothes behind and all that. Uh, that's not the kind of rapture that the Bible is talking about. A good example of, of the biblical kind of rapture is a bodily change like Enoch had. In, in, in Genesis, Enoch was walking with God and he was no more. He's vanished into the thin air. And that's the kind of bodily change that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 54, where those saints were changed bodily into the unseen realm. They disappeared, and they were no longer on earth in a visible form, and were caught up to be with Christ, along with the resurrected dead, in the unseen realm. And so, no bodies floated up into the sky. No clothes were left. Uh, you know, none All right. of that kind of stuff. So, the, uh, movies, the left behind movies, try to picture it as. Yeah, let me, let me ask you a point of clarification. So, and then I want to go into, in reality, your, your expertise with the historical background. So, but let's finish this thought. Um, okay, so let's, let's imagine uh, the rapture is what it is is what you say it is. And so let's pretend that on one particular day of the week, the rapture is going to happen as a punctiliar event in time. And I'm, I'm walking along with a non-believing Jew, and I'm preaching the gospel to him because I want him to believe in the Messiah. And the rapture happens. What does he experience in terms of my being harpazoed out of the uh, vicinity? Well, first of all, that is an uh, incorrect application or hypothetical uh, to use because the conditions of society at the point when the rapture occurred is very, very much uh, radically different what we experience today in 21st century America. For instance, uh, back during World War II, almost, uh, what, 75 years ago, the Jews were being rounded up every night and hauled away and put in concentration camps and killed. And their, their friends and neighbors would only know the next morning that they were evidently uh, gone, and the only thing they would have thought about is that they were arrested in the night and taken away to be killed. They would not have believed a rapture or anything else like that because they didn't, didn't even know that there was supposed to be a rapture. Okay, so let me ask yeah. this Let me ask this question, then on, on following that a bit of clarification. <clears throat> then it seems to me if we were in the 20th century, we would have a mass reporting of missing persons, right? Okay. You see it here in our 21st century culture because we've got news media everywhere recording that stuff, but they didn't have that in their century. But that still would have been the same milieu, if you will, that technically if there were missing persons to be reported, you would have had kingdom-wide, uh, uh, empire-wide reports of mass people disappearing. But as you say, and I understand what you're arguing, you say in the middle of the night, it's just like every, they they just they weren't there the next day, and no one. Okay, all right. All right now, see the, the the element that is not really understood by even preterist is the, the neurotic persecution. This is the eight hundred pound elephant or gorilla, eight hundred pound gorilla in the room, which nobody notices the neurotic persecution that occurred. In the summer of 64, all the way down to the outbreak of the Zealot Rebellion, 
rebellion in 66, almost two years of persecution that was against the church. And it was the outbreak of that Zealot rebellion in April of 66, which cut short that tribulation upon the church. And notice in Matthew 24, verse 31, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and so on. And then he'll send forth his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds. Now, what is missed by most of us, and was missed by me for a long time, is that the, the coming of Christ and the sending forth of his angels to gather his elect occurs immediately after the persecution, the neurotic persecution. That means when all of the Roman Empire Jews and their Roman overlords were allowing them to round up all the Christians and put them to death. In that scenario, it would be very much like the Jews in, in uh, Russia or in Germany during World War II. Uh, they, the Jews were in their own ghettos. They were not living next door to the, to the Romans and the Jews. The Christians were in their own separate ghettos, and they were not living next door. Their next door neighbors would never even have known what happened to them because they were not anywhere near them. They wouldn't live next to the Christians because they were afraid they would be rounded up and taken away to be killed just like the Christians were. So we have to understand how the culture and society worked back in those days during the demonic persecution. All right, let me... That's why they fled from Judea and went to Pella and other places outside of Judea in order to get away from that persecution. Yeah. So they were not near unbelievers. And so unbelievers would not even have known that they left in the night. And if they did notice their disappearance the next day, they would have only thought that they were rounded up in that neurotic person. Okay. wouldn't dare go down to the local authorities and ask where they are for fear of being arrested themselves, you know? Yeah. So, one more question of clarification then, or at least, uh, yeah, I guess I would call it clarification. In Matthew 24, we see, in my opinion, an exclusive Jewish persecution during the tribulation, so that Jesus says to the Pharisees, uh, the... The vindication of all of the innocent bloodshed since Abel is going to come down upon this generation. And you guys, in your piety and arrogance and hypocrisy, say, if we had been alive when our fathers were alive, we would not have killed the prophets. And Jesus basically says, okay, I'm going to give you a chance to prove that. I'm going to send you my witnesses, I'm going to send you my scribes and my disciples, and you're going to murder them. You're going to flog them. You're going to chase them from town to town. So in Matthew 24, we have a narrow view of the tribulation, which is exclusively, in my opinion, the adversarial context of Judaism against Christianity. But what I hear you saying is, in the book of Revelation, we have an adumbration of, an, a, a development of that tribulation when it becomes... Uh, employed by the empire so that Nero becomes a part of the tribulation because he does in fact persecute Christ's followers do you understand the distinction I'm making I don't deny what you're saying yeah. I'm yeah, saying I, that it's I think that's a, a fair uh, representation of, of what Matthew was saying but when we compare that with Mark's account and Luke's account and especially the way Paul deals with the tribulation in his writings uh, to say the Thessalonians there, uh, we'll notice that Paul especially differentiates between the tribulation of the church and the wrath outpouring to the Jews. And so that was, those were two phases. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, he makes the point that it is time for judgment to begin. And if it must begin with us first. And if that's the case, 
those who disobey the gospel. You know, and it's referring to the Jews there. So the, the tribulation had to come first upon the church and fill up the measure of the wrath that the fathers had partially filled up yeah. by persecuting Christ. And then, uh, when they killed his followers and his apostles in that final generation, that filled up the cup of, of wrath, and it was poured out. And so the tribulation upon the church was what filled up that cup. And then that wrath was poured out. And so Matthew 24 alludes to that. You know, notice it says in Matthew 24, um, verse 9, it says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation. Well, who is the they in that context? And who is the you? Then they will deliver you right. to tribulation. Right. I, I, that's the you is the, is the Christians, and the they is the Jews. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um. So, okay. So in my when I usually have guests on, I um try to uh, what's the word? Wet the palate. I try to grease the wheel in terms of getting our ideas going and flowing by asking different investigative questions hermeneutically. But I think I'm just going to jump straight to my extra biblical question where I ask a question regarding church history and extra biblical sources and how those extra biblical, quote unquote, non-inspired texts inform and help us understand you know, because, I mean, if you take a fundamentalist to the nth degree, all he reads is the Bible. I don't need no Josephus. I don't need no church history. It's just me and God. I can read the Bible and know everything I need to know. Well, yeah. but what's so interesting about that is that every single person who says that is not consistent. Whenever they get into a situation where they need historical testimony, guess what? They pull it out, and they use it. So, I mean, they're not consistent on that. Sure. I don't know anybody yeah. that's consistent on that. Can you think, of maybe, can you think of maybe an example of that? Just give us a tangible, concrete example from your abstract condemnation of those fundies. Well, in the introduction to my final decade book, I discussed this whole issue of how we use history. And let, let me see if I can find that real quickly here. I like to summarize it because it's, it's quite a lengthy section, so I'll just go ahead and summarize it from memory. Uh, basically, what it is is that um, I've got a lot of, of uh, challenges from people like Tommy Ice and Ken Gentry and other people who will make that same claim. Uh, for instance, Ken Gentry and his uh, little paper that he wrote against us uh, said, you know, you guys are using Josephus and you're using all these other writers outside the Bible to make your case, but you're not using the Bible uh, to make your case. And, and he turns right around and uses the creeds against us. Yeah, right. You, know, you see the problem there? <laughs> it's okay for him to use the creeds, but it's not okay for us to use Josephus. Well, that's because the creeds. That's because here. Okay, are you ready? Listen, let's let's have a little bit of a of a segue. Um, that's because, and I'm in a I'm in a theological email with a reformed conservative, strongly James Jordan in in uh, influenced pastor right now, where he's arguing that the creeds have shown us what the unity of the church has declared for the past two thousand years. So the argument then is Ed. The Spirit has, um, oh, what's the word? It just went away from me. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, superintended the pristine affirmation of the church and the creeds. Josephus isn't that. Right. Well, I would agree with that, except for the fact that, that the creeds are not inspired. And Ken Gentry, in his little tract called uh, The Usefulness of Creeds, have that or not, but it's a nice little summary of how we use the creeds properly. Uh, very good statements in there, and he makes the point that creeds are useful because they include 
include both scriptural and interpretations and applications content. So it's not just scripture in the creeds. There is inspired information in there, but there is also uninspired information, applications and interpretations put into the creeds. And I was amazed that he admitted that in his little track on the usefulness of creeds. But I don't think he sees the implications of that. If the creeds contain more than just scripture, if they include interpretations and applications like you say they do, and as the uh, Westminster Confession also says, then we can only depend on that biblical content as being absolutely inspired and true. We always must be reforming our interpretations and applications uh, because they're not inspired and therefore they have to be subject to uh, investigation over and over again until they're completely biblical. And I don't think the church historically has ever challenged the eschatological sections of the creed. Yeah, yeah, well, well but, right, right, but see, that's, that's the, the doing that's, that's the, pre challenge. yeah, and that's the preponderance of the majority. You, the reason why they haven't been questioned is the same reason why, technically, I'm just going to make this up, Baptists don't question baptism. Or Presbyterians don't question baptism. That's their culture. They're, of course they're going to deny. Of course those wacky Baptists. Of course those wacky Presbyterians. Of course those wacky Pentecostals are wrong because our culture, the church that we belong to, is promoting the... Um, the veracity of what the scriptures teach. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dance. Ed. you know, I wish that I knew, I wish I knew that, you know, 20 years ago, I wish I knew I would be where I am now theologically because I would have documented everything and I would have thought through, okay, now how is this going to totally, it's like the butterfly effect, this little nuance that I'm, that I'm conceding is going to have dramatic effects 15 years later, and I don't even know it. So what you're talking about is the power and the persuasiveness and the preventiveness. Know how? Notice how I'm a good preacher. I got three alliterations there, right? Of of our Christian culture. Our Christian culture inoculates us to thinking outside of the box. And when, here it is, Ed, here's a, a large part of why I started my podcast. When our subconscious, no, subconscious, rears up and is screaming at us that the text is telling us something different than what our tradition has told us, we have a we have a conflict of our operating system and we crash. Yeah, they call it cognitive dissonance. Hey, wow! I knew you'd pick up on that. Excellent. You see how I handed that off to you, Ed? <laughs> All right, good job. Okay, so okay, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's just start now. So we're what? How does the extra biblical histories of the first century? How do they help us navigate what happened in the first century? Well, no creeds, no history, no traditions can ever trump Scripture. Scripture is the only thing that we can trust absolutely. It's absolute truth. And it's the absolute standard for all morals, ethics, and spiritual principles. No other tradition, no other historian can match that. No, nothing else can trump Scripture. Uh, and so the best they can do is provide a better understanding of Scripture or maybe support Scripture, but they can never overthrow Scripture. You can see easily how Josephus supports and helps explain what Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation is talking about. And that's the way it happened for me. Whenever I saw that book of Josephus in my friend's uh, library shelf in college, I went down to the bookstore right away.
Friday and grabbed a copy of Josephus and started reading it. And I devoured it. I, I underlined every page and highlighted it, put notes in the margin, and read it all the way through. And that was just an amazing explanation. And one of the things I noticed when I was reading through it, and I was reading through the Bible at the same time, and I had just finished reading the book of Revelation when I got that Josephus and started reading through it. And in Josephus, it mentions that the weight of those uh, ballistae stones that the uh, Roman catapult engines would throw, the weight of those stones was about a pound each, which is about 70, 75 pounds. And then I noticed in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, it was talking about this great hailstorm that came against the uh, Babylon Harvard city. And it noted that the weight of those hailstones was about a talent each. And you can just imagine the impact that had on my brain when I read that statement in Josephus. I said, wow, could there be a connection between Josephus? And so I began to go in into the commentaries on Revelation at the library to see if I could see if there was any kind of connection. And I went down to the bookstore and bought all the commentaries on Revelation that they had, and I stumbled on one called The Book of Revelation by Foy Wallace. He's a Church of Christ guy back in the 1950s. And he wrote a commentary saying that the Book of Revelation was written before 70 A.D., and it was describing the destruction of Jerusalem. And that just blew my socks off. I sat right down in the, on the linoleum floor in the bookstore and started reading that book. I couldn't wait to get home and read it. And about ten pages into it, I noticed he was spending a lot of time talking about the date of Revelation. And that's the first commentary I had ever read which spent more than a page or two on the date. And so I started reading and reading and reading and he made made the point that this book cannot be understood if we don't know when it was written. And he says it's obviously written just before those events were going to occur. It could not be talking about something way off in the future because the first three verses of the book says that these things are about to take place. The time of their fulfillment is at hand. And that just blew me away. And from that point on, I was hooked on a pre-70 date from the book of Revelation. And I couldn't get enough information on it. And he quoted from Josephus politically in there. And he made that same connection in Revelation chapter 16 with Josephus that I had picked up when I was reading Josephus. And that, I mean, that that basically moved me right into the prayer's view from that point on. So let me ask you to give us a little bit of a, uh, a critical eye to Josephus. How would you encourage us to be balanced as we read him? Well, we need to remember that every writer unless he's inspired, has his own uh, weaknesses and prejudices and perspectives that he writes from. And Josephus is uh, certainly a good example of that. Uh, he was a Jewish priest, conservative in his politics, and uh, but he was a compromiser with Rome. And he wanted to keep the peace so he's got a lot of different elements. All right, let me let me stop you there. Let me stop you there and ask how you can give that evaluation. How do you know he kowtowed to the man? Well, he says so, first of all. Okay. In numerous places in his life, in his account, his, his biographical, autobiographical uh, uh, writings there about his life, he talks about his perspective. So he tells us where he's writing from, okay. where he's coming from. I, I have to be honest with you, Ed. I am I am not strong in historical um, theology and uh, second 
I, I was going to say Second Temple, but that's still relevant because of the, the intertestamental period. I've got a friend who's my co-host, Jonathan Sedlak, who has just blown me out of the water with his familiarity with the Second Temple literature and other is issues. Um, so that's why I like to rely on him and ask him questions and ask people like you these questions because everybody has their strengths. Um, so I, the reason why I asked about your uh, criticism of, of Josephus was because, you know, to be honest, I, I haven't read him. Um, and so I wanted to know, you know, what gave you the insight to understand his uh, relationship with the uh, uh, Roman Empire. But that's, that's right. a good statement, yeah. Interpreting anything, any literature, we always need to ask those basic five questions. You know, who wrote it, who was it written, when, where, and why. Uh, and the first of those questions, of course, is who wrote it. And you really need to know who that person is as much as you possibly can. For instance, if we say that Apostle Paul wrote the book of First Corinthians, well, who was Apostle Paul? What made him tick? You know, what? Where was he coming from when he wrote that book? And why was it that he felt it necessary to write those particular things to that particular audience on that occasion at that time and place? And so those are the kind of questions that we have to ask. And we need to know the author as well as possible because the way he writes is coming from his own perspective. And if we don't know who he is and what perspective he we're going to miss all those little nuances and innuendos that uh, can only be understood if we know him, how he thinks, and why he thinks that way. So, very important to know your author. Context yeah, yeah. Back to the revelation again. Um, I get people asking me all the time, why don't you do a series of podcasts on the book of Revelation? And I, every time I'll say, I will as soon as I get the history understood, and they, they say, what do you mean? I say, well, you really can't interpret anything unless you know the historical background behind its writing. And that, you know, there's kind of like three legs to a stool in hermeneutics. You've got the historical aspect, of course. You've got the grammatical, uh, contextual aspect to have it in its context and know the grammar and the, and the uh, uh, linguistics that are involved in, in the culture. And then, of course, you've got to know the cosmological worldview from which the writer and his audience are coming from. So those are the kind of like the three most essential ingredients in a good hermeneutic. You've got the grammatical, contextual, you've got the historical, cosmological worldview. So those are very important. And for me, the history is what provides the context and the grammar and the cosmology. Because if you understand the history and the culture of a certain writer, then you'll understand his cosmological worldview and his grammar and his contextual material as well. So I mean, it's all wrapped up in Getting to know that person historically, who he was, how he thinks, and that's why I spend so much time in the history, is in order to understand the book of Revelation, you've got to know the history. For instance, you know, the futurists speculate on the fulfillments of every chapter in the book of Revelation, and I mean, you can set down 50 futurists, even pre-mill dispensational futurists, side by side at the table and ask them to explain chapter 16 in the Revelation. And you probably have 51 different interpretations and speculations on what that chapter is talking about, even within a pre-mill dispensational viewpoint. And so I ask myself, how in the world can we avoid making that kind of speculative approach to Revelation. Why don't we set ourselves down and lay out in front of us the real history as
as this happened, blow by blow. And in order to do that, we have to go back into Josephus, Tacitus, and Yosipon, uh, and Hegesippus, and Eusebius, and pull all that Roman Jewish and Christian history back out and put it into a logical, sequential uh, order in a historical historical account. That's what I've done in my final decade book. I've tried to pull all those events and put them in sequential order, one right after the other, and then connect the dots between those events. It's called historical reconstruction. And I did that for the very reason that I wanted to be able to see how these events that the book of Revelation is talking about were actually fulfilled. And so back in late that historical account right down beside the book of Revelation and connect the links between them so that we can see how it actually happened and how the book of Revelation is predicting it. And we can prove the fulfillment of those things by looking at the real history as it really happened. That's the purpose of my final decade book is to enable me then to do that very thing in the book of Revelation, to lay my book right down beside it and connect the dots. All right, so the million-dollar question. But before we get into that million-dollar question, I completely forgot to do my Take It Easy segment with Ed. So I had to call him back at another time, and what you're about to hear right now is that interaction with Take It Easy. All right, Ed, we have been uh, talking about some quite heady theological concepts, and I want to take a little bit of a break with my segment that I call Take It Easy. I'm going to throw you some softballs, and I want to see how uh, quick you can respond and give us the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? All right. All right. Cookies or ice cream? Oh, man, I'm a cookie monster, so I love those cookies. Do you drink your coffee with contaminants or black? With the creamer. Lots of it. Corporate body or individual? Well, of course the individual body. I mean, <laughs> All right. There Oval is no team. other possibility. <laughs> Oval teen or Oval tin? Don't have a clue what either one of those are. So all right, all right. No comment. Preterist or historicist? Well, of course, preterist. Book or movie version? Oh, I'm a book reader. I'm a reader. IPA or PRI? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> IPA, of course. Harpazo. Or rapture? Well, harpazo, of course, is the Greek, and uh, rapture is from the Latin word. So in the Latin Bible, you'd have the rapture, and in the Greek Bible, you'd have harpazo. Got it. Constantine or Constantin? Well, that's two different pronunciations. Both of them are correct, depending on whether you come from Texas or from uh, Greece. (laughs) Mountains or beach? Oh, beach. City or country? Country. I'm a country guy. Fresh water or salt? You turn talk about fish. I love saltwater fish better than fresh water. Okay. And root beer or Coca Cola? I'm a Coke man. And lastly, Augustine or Augustine? Yeah, same thing. You know, depending on where you're from, you're going to pronounce it differently. You know, I don't think that it actually depends on where you're from. It depends on what theological snobbery you you subscribe to because I feel like all of the theological snobs call him Augustine. Augustine. So all of my little little pronunciation tricks were, this is my argumentation whenever I talk to somebody and they say Augustine, I say who? And they say Augustine, I say who? And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, okay, listen. When you were a kid, did your mom make you Ovaltine, or did she make you Ovaltine? <laughs> I say, know, I say, who was the first? Me, uh, I say, I say, who who was the first Christian emperor? Constantine or Constantine? Nobody calls him Constantine. So that's my little uh, 
that's my little uh, phonetic uh, joke. So, all right, Ed. Well, there you go. Take it easy. Take it easy. The million dollar question is the thousand years. So, in your study of the extra biblical history, has anything come across your path that has given you influence in terms of understanding what the thousand years is or or where do you go to establish the basis for saying this is how we need to understand this term yeah absolutely uh, way back when i was in new york city uh, right after i got out of the seminary in the late 70s um, i was going to the synagogue every tuesday night to study Talmud with a uh, Orthodox Jewish rabbi there in his uh, minion of uh, Jewish people, Jewish guys. And as I began to study the Talmud with those guys, I noticed this phrase, Millennium of the Messiah, coming up in their in their discussions quite often. And I asked them, what, what is this Millennium of the Messiah, or this Days of the Messiah? And they said, well, it's it's a period of time between this world and the world to come, in which the Messiah comes and closes out the old world and ushers in the new world. And they refer to it as a transitionary stage between this world and the world to come. And by, you know, I mean, that just blew me away when I heard that name, and they call it the Millennium of the Messiah, because they didn't know how long it would take for him to wind down the old world and bring in the new world, and so they gave the Messiah a thousand years to do that. Okay, so let's... The day of the, days of the Messiah. Yeah, let's unpack that a little bit, because that's a, that's a fascinating insight to bring into this conversation, and... That goes into a, a lot of my attempts to assess and uh, critically evaluate statements such as what you just made. So here's here's my my query for us to maybe throw around. Um, let's say, for instance, if we if we are uh, discussing Revelation 21, and uh, I, I'm in a Sunday school class and the teacher says, okay, so what, what do you think is going on here? What do you think this new heavens and this new earth is? And people give their answers, and I sit back, and then I wait for everybody to be done, and I say, uh, I, I think an important question for us to understand is, where does John get this idea? Is he... Well, you notice that it, he doesn't stop and explain it. No, no, I... Soon, right. His readers already understood it. Yeah, yeah. See, that's, that's another one of my fun little maxims. Here it is. You ready for it, Ed? The Bible often says what it says without explaining what it says because it expects its readers to understand what it says without having to say what it said. That's exactly right. Right? Amen? Amen. All right. Okay. But that's part of my point. So here's my question for your interesting insight to the Jews. I would have asked them this question. That still doesn't answer my question of where you're, why are you, why you are using that term. Where, where is the predicate for this? term why do you call it the millennium of the messiah why didn't you call it the decade of the messiah or the 40 days of the messiah why the thousand years so my question would still well, be yeah there's a good reason for that uh, they believe that the messiah would pull that off in 1000 years because they viewed the world history as uh, being 7000 years and they gave the messiah thousand years to make that transition from the old world to the new world. Excellent. Okay, now, Ed, I, I'm, I wish that my friend Jonathan Sedlak was here because he just brought this up to me the other day. He just said to me, he and I were talking on the phone, what do we do with the thousand years? What do we do? What do we do? He goes, I'm going to go study it real quick. Five minutes later, he goes, you won't believe what I just found. <laughs> And he found these references that you're, you're talking about. Okay, so as we were throwing these around, Here's my assessment, though, okay? You've got 2nd century Judaism and on that, that begins to corrupt the text of the, of the Tanakh. 
because it wants to dismantle any opportunity for Christianity to say, this is Christ in the Old Testament. So in my mind, this explanation is a futurist um, attempt to, to argue against the fact that Christ couldn't have been the Messiah. He can't have been the Messiah because we still have 2,000 years to go. So there, it's impossible. So right now we're, we're disproving the fact that Jesus was Messiah. So even though you're offering an opportunity for us to understand the thousand years in Revelation 20, I'm going to possibly throw out that does not therefore inform us because my assessment of why they're calling it that is because they're trying to dehistoricize human history in order to disprove that Christ was the Messiah. Okay, now I need to respond to that. And Excellent. Not every rabbi, in fact, I would not say that even the majority of rabbis would give a thousand years to the Messiah to complete that process. For instance, there was three rabbis in the first century, Akiba and Rabbi Eliezer and another guy, uh, who suggested that the Messiah's millennium would actually be a 40-year period, much like the wilderness wandering when the Israelites came out of Egypt and uh, prepared themselves to enter the promised land. And so those three rabbis in the first century viewed the Messiah's millennium as a 40-year period of transition. So, so what you're basically saying is, is that although you had experience with this uh, millennial mess messianic expectation, it's not uniform. That's right, and uh, that's what we today don't understand about the Jews in the first century. They were a mixed multitude of different concepts. For instance, Philo was down in Alexandria, and he taught, or he was the leader of the Hellenistic Jews, and you see that uh, Stephen in Acts chapter 6 is debating Christianity with some Hellenistic Jews, and right there in Jerusalem, and evidently the Hellenistic Jews were very strong in Jerusalem itself. They had a huge basis right there, and they used the Septuagint, the Greek scriptures, as their Old Testament. And that was just one of the perspectives within Judaism. You've got the Pharisees, Sadducees, you've got the Essenes, who were very eschatological and apocalyptic in their understanding of things. And the Essenes used Greek scriptures as well as the Hebrew scriptures. So there's a lot of different perspectives floating around in Judaism in the first century. And we Christians today just don't realize that. We think that they all had a unified view of everything. <laughs> and that's not the case at all. It's especially well, not the case today. Yeah, well, I mean we, we even have that in the in the biblical record with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, we aren't given insight into the Essenes and the Qumran communities, but we do have two factions of uh, religious leaders which uh, make up the Sanhedrin. So um, just just because this question came to my mind right now, let me ask it. What in your mind, when the Sadducees come to Jesus with their question about the resurrection and marriage, what is their agenda and what is their concept of resurrection? Because this is probably one of the fundamental arguments that partial preterists or futurists argue in terms of discounting the fact that the resurrection didn't happen. Because obviously, you're married, dude. If you were married, if you believed this, you wouldn't be married. So help us understand your understanding of what exactly the Sadducees were trying to do when they asked Christ this question. Okay, that's Luke chapter 20, verses 27 and following. And the Sadducees did not believe in the angels. They did not believe in uh, consciousness after death. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in a conscious afterlife. And so they were what we would call the annihilationists of our day, except that they believed every person would cease to exist, not just the wicked. And so they were coming from that perspective of this life is all we have, and we better make the most of it. And so to them, the idea of resurrection 
But here's my problem. Here's my problem with that, Ed. And this is my this is my working analogy that my my working metaphor that I'm I'm purporting throughout my podcasts. Okay. So here the the problem with my understanding, and I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I'm not trying to discount it at all, I'm just trying to interact with it. So the Sadducees offer up though the Leveret marriage as an example for their proving the absurdity of the resurrection. Okay, a woman, okay, a woman has has married uh, five husbands because neither of them gave her a, a child. But then, lo and behold, at the end of it all, they all die, and she doesn't have any children. Okay, so in the resurrection, whose whose wife will she be? Okay, now here. Yeah. See what their are. Well, let me let me. That's not the case. They're not going to be raised back into this world. They're going to be raised into the world above. Well, let me let me flesh out a little bit of where my thoughts are on this, and then see if that helps uh, direct our our discussion. So let me get back to where I was thinking. So the the Sadducees say, okay, here's a situation. This woman in the Leveret marriage, whose oh, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And Jesus basically says, okay. You know, they, he basically castigates them the same way he did Nicodemus. You guys are teachers of Israel, and you don't know the answer to this question, because here's here's the here is the non sequitur of their question. Jesus should have said, "Guys, that's a non sequitur. That's not even an issue," because the Torah is the yellow brick road. You guys are following Torah. You just gave me a leveret of uh, marriage. A stipulation which is Torah. Torah is going to end because it gives way to the new age of resurrection. The resurrection is not a metaphysical existence out of this world. It is the transition from the old covenant where the leveret marriage was valid and when the new creation comes we aren't going to have resurrected people living next beside us united in marriage again it's not you guys are thinking along a completely different plane you neither know the scriptures nor the power of god so he's in my mind christ is actually addressing a biblical theological point that they don't understand the nature of torah he's basically saying look guys you're on the yellow brick road, and I'm the one declaring to you. You see up there? Look in the look on the horizon behind me. In 40 years, the culmination of the kingdom, when the temple is destroyed, is going to be the end of the yellow brick road. And if you have not crossed over the threshold into the kingdom, you're going to perish. So all of this talk and this stuff that you're trying to throw at me and, and throw me off about this marriage stuff is a complete non sequitur. Yeah, that's certainly. Now uh, let me let me say this. Guys don't think, uh, yeah, let me say this though. I, again, because I sent you my paper on all of Eshenism, which I am trying to uh, propagate and promote as the marriage of the corporate body view and the individual body view, because I think that they are both biblically substantiated. And we have to have a better grasp of biblical theology in order to do the dance. Um, so I'm going to say to you, Ed, I'm not going. I'm not trying to take away from you the application of the physical resurrection because I believe in a physical resurrection. I believe that that is an aspect of it, but I'm going to say that's not the primary address of what Jesus was talking about because when the resurrection occurred in that generation, uh, the reality of it is the transition of that age to this age, which is an epical transition and not a metaphysical one. So okay. I'm. And now, if we look at the text, though, uh, look at the wording that's used in Luke chapter 20, verses 35 to 37. Notice it says, the resurrection from out of the dead ones. Yeah. Question. Where were the dead ones? Right, I think 
Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I think that you have to. I'm again. I'm not trying to deny the both and. I'm trying to bring in the both. So I'm going to default simply to Ezekiel 37, Hosea 13, and Daniel 12. That's. Yeah, but those are outside the context. We have to look at the context first. Well, I I wouldn't say. What's, what's he Right. I would say that the in the same way, Ed, when I challenge my futurist friends on 1 Corinthians 15 and they say, and when the end comes, he's going to deliver the kingdom to his father. And they say, that's the end of history. And I say, you're butchering the analogy of scripture. You're butchering the uniformity of scripture because what informs your interpretation of the end? Because Paul mentions the end in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What does he mean by the end there? Well, that's the end of history. Okay, let's keep backing it up. Where does he get his information? And then when they go to, to uh, the Olivet Discourse, I'm going, that's not talking about the end of, wor of the world. So my response to your um, uh, interaction in this situation is to say, I believe that the meta-narrative, the biblical theology of Israel's resurrection as a nation is what is is what informs our understanding of the context in Luke chapter 19. You're right. Well, it certainly could be, but then again, we have to ask, was there such a thing as a uniform definition of resurrection from the of the dead ones within Judaism? Or did, was there various views, even within the Pharisees, about what that phrase yeah, I don't think that precludes arguing from a uniformity of Scripture because, again, I would say this. In the same way that the dispensationalists create their parenthetical epic of, uh, of um, uh, until, until the 70th week is completed, my criticism is your concept of the kingdom is flawed. You're wrong. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had a concept of what the kingdom was supposed to look like. And when yeah, Christ they differed on that concept, and even among themselves, the Pharisees did not have a uniform concept, neither did the Sadducees. Yeah, but that doesn't preclude my point of saying this is what the scriptures mean. In in Daniel twelve, it's talking about the resurrection of Israel. In Ezekiel thirty seven, it's talking about the resurrection of Israel. Simply because Well now, I would question the Daniel seven perspective. Uh, Ezekiel thirty seven is clearly talking the restoration from Babylonian captivity and it refers to that as a resurrection of the nation. Uh, it's another jump indeed to apply that in another context without contextual verification of it. And that's what I'm questioning here. Where do you see contextual verification that that's what is in mind here in Luke chapter 20? I don't see it. That is an excellent that is an excellent question, Ed, and I am going to say we're going to have to come back for another episode and pick this up. How about that for a cliffhanger? That's good. <laughs> so we're at like 55 minutes in our episode right now, so I want to wrap it up because I don't want to have to keep opening up good cans of worms. But um, that's a great question, and uh, I will work on thinking through that. And when we're able to touch base again in the future, let's, let's pick it back up from there and, and keep talking. Alright, sounds good. Alright, alright. So tell us again the name of your book and where we can find it online. Okay, it's Final Decade Before the End and the subtitled Jewish and Christian History Just Before the Jewish Revolt. And uh, it's available on our website, www.preterist.org. Alright, 